Hello, everyone. This is Frank Riker. And this is Darren Sands. And this is the Slaughter Lamb Podcast. Hey, Darren, what's going on? Been a busy week. Lots of things going on in my um, private life. <laughs> Just boring stuff. Cat getting bitten by a dog, boiler breaking down, all that kind of shit. Just domestic woe at the moment. So uh, uh, I haven't really had much time to watch anything. I did watch something on um, Amazon, a new Amazon Prime movie called I Care A Lot with Peter Dinklage and Rosamund Pike, which is a really good little thriller. You should check it out. Very dark, very black, in its, you know, in, with its humour, um, and definitely worth a, a couple of hours of your time. Sounds good. I, I've, I haven't watched anything new recently. I went back and uh, binge watch a whole bunch of Laurel and Hardy. And I thought, oh, I thought fantastic. I, would get, I thought I'd give myself a little chuckle, some clean comedy. You know, and uh, I just love uh, Oliver's fourth wall. You know, he he was the master at breaking that down. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I've been, uh, that's what I've been doing. And I also have gotten in uh, the special edition of Wolf that I talked to you about privately. So uh, so we, so you managed to talk about Wolf the other week before the special edition arrived then? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, you know what it is with what's going on? The mail takes forever to get anywhere. Tell me about it. I'm still waiting for my Halloween David Gordon Green book. <laughs> that was the beginning of February, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. It still hasn't arrived yet. It's still in Jamaica, but not that Jamaica. <laughs> Jamaica, New York. It's just sitting there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to go through it because it looks like there's a, um, a lot of commentary, a lot of behind the scenes, uh, interviews from red carpets, uh, alternate endings. And this was something that was done on... Um, you know, over there across the pond, over by you, and all, they only made three thousand. Um, I don't try and get hold of that. Was was that was is that a was is Powerhouse or Indicator a big company? Um, not particularly, no. Um, the the ones that really, I mean, obviously, you know, Arrow Film Distribution, and um, the other one which is making a real name for itself over here at the moment is Second Sight, who did um, they did the Assault on Precinct Thirteen box set. They then did, I think, they did When a Stranger Calls, if I remember rightly. But they also were the guys that did the Dawn of the Dead kind of box set that came out recently which is just fantastic and that you know they i think that's totally sold out now you can't get that for uh, um at all so um yeah they're, 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 that's the one that's big, but the, the company that did the wolf blu-ray i must admit i hadn't heard of them before but it looks like a pretty decent package yeah it came with a little booklet with uh some uh reading material inside not just pictures or anything and uh i'm looking forward to it so i'll probably get to it you know either today or later in the week and maybe veg out and go through the whole thing because yeah. sometimes as you know watching a movie plus doing commentary and watching everything behind the scenes could take up a whole fucking day oh for sure yeah it's like uh, i don't know how people can watch you know the director's cut or the unedited version of the lord of the rings trilogy i i, I don't think i could sit down for a whole day to watch it <laughs> i do, I, I mean i you know i got i've seen them i would never want to watch them again i know there are lots of fans out there i'm sorry i'm not one of them you know and that whole there, there's a comedian that did a whole routine about this i, I can't remember his name now but he kind of pointed out, which I noticed probably about 10 minutes into the second movie, which is all anybody does in these films is fucking walk. They're just walking. <laughs> <laughs> and walking and walking. And the fucking movies are like 12 hours long when you get those director's cuts. 12 hours of little people walking. <laughs> the correct term is hobbits. <laughs> hobbits, then. Don't call me a peck. I'm a hobbit. But then I then I started to watch the um, the Hobbit trilogy and and like the first one, um, it's such a shame that Guillermo del Toro didn't get to do it. But like the the first movie, I was like, what the fuck am I watching here? And now I'm watching little people um, washing up and singing. I, I I've no time for it to be honest. I I'll, I've watched them all, and you know I thought yeah they're nicely put together, but. I'm not a huge fan, and I'm certainly not looking forward to the Amazon TV show. No, it's it's not a fr franchise that I'm, I, I, you know, covet or really enjoy going back to. I don't, and I, I just leave it be. That's it. I can't stand it, to be honest. Or will we ever talk about it, because it's been talked about to death for no! people. No! 
No, <laughs> this is not what this channel's about. <laughs> but we are excited to talk about one of the all-time John Carpenter classics in a, a cult movie, 1982's The Thing, a remake from uh, 1951's The Thing from Another World. 100,000 years ago, it found its way into our galaxy. Trapped in the frozen wasteland of Antarctica, it could not escape. Now, the men of Station 4 have made a monumental discovery. An alien creature had frozen, but not to death. And man... It isn't Benning! ...is the warmest place to hide. Based on a book which was written in the 1930s, I think, called um, Who Goes There by John W. Campbell. Isn't it funny that when we talk about the thing, we have to say John Carpenter's The Thing. It's almost like we always have to say that every time we have to talk about this movie in order to Uh, differentiate from other movies. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I think it was one of the things that he he insisted on early on in his career. And quite rightly so, you know. Why not? If you can get away with having your name in front of the title of the movie, then superb. It's a really old-fashioned thing to do, but, you know, Mm -hmm. I kind of like that he did that. Let me just ask you this. When's the first time you saw John Carpenter's The Thing? My dad was was a copper. He invited my mom and my sisters, I think, to, to, I think it was like a Christmas party that was taking place in the bar of um, of his police station. They did it every year. And the TV was on. In the background was the the scene in the thing with the defibrillators, and I, I was just transfixed. I was just I was like, "What the hell is this?" And my mum was going, "Oh, you, you've got to turn it over. You've got to turn it over." And I was like, "Mom, don't don't tell him to turn this over. This is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. What the hell is it?" Uh, and found out, you know, this was probably about 1984, I guess that um, I first or saw part of the movie. And then not long after that, my dad sat me down and we watched the whole thing. And I'm in awe of it now as much as I was back when I was a small boy. And watching it just yesterday, I was like, Jesus Christ, this stuff looks so real. Because it's happening in front of you. What they do in this film is literally happening in front of you. It's not computer technology. It's it's practical work by a 22-year-old effects eyes. Rob Bettine was only 22 when he did this. It's, it's mm-hmm. incredible. And you, it's so visceral. You can you can smell it. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're right. You know, then I remember every Friday night, or maybe even Saturday morning, my dad would take me to the video store. Just me. He, he was like, your brother's you know, doesn't want to do anything with me. So I'll take you. I was like, oh, great. We'll go to the video store. So we went up and down the aisle. And you and me are, are relatively close in age, so we looked at covers as a kid and said, yeah, I want that one. Yeah. The cover for The Thing doesn't really explain much, does it? It's just no. it's, it's just a painting by Drew um, Struzan, who also did um, posters for Star Wars and Back to the Future. Yeah. And yeah. that explained a lot. So my dad says, let's, let's see if we can rent this. You know, let's rent The Thing. And uh, I said, I have no idea what it's about. Uh, but he's like, maybe it's, he never, he didn't know anything about it either. He says, maybe it's, you know, a remake. Even back then, he was like, maybe it's a remake. So we got home and we watched it. And I remember as a kid being bored. Really? Bored. Now, I was probably four or five. And, and my dad, I think, was a little bit bored too by it. Um, until that defibrillator scene came up. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> and then, all right, now we got something going on here. And yeah. the cat and mouse game that's being played, uh, the who's who, that then it started ramping up. And as certainly as I got older, you know, I was just like, this movie is just great. It's awesome. And you certainly do appreciate Rob Bottin's effects. Little known fact that, you know, that his, his effect work almost killed him on this movie because <laughs> he was exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure how much pre production was involved, but. It's almost like he was given sort of carte blanche to do whatever mad shit he could dream up. You know, it, it doesn't look like there was... I, I don't know how much of a plan there was to make these to make this creature morph like it does throughout the film. But just when you think you've seen one of the most disgusting things ever, they play another card and outdo the last scene. It's incredible. And as I said to you before... In, in high definition now, you look at this stuff and I can't even begin to, to describe the detail on, you know, for example, when they first bring that, that frozen body back from the, from the Norwegian camp that they visit and they unveil it and there's all, you can see all the dry ice coming out as they unveil it and then slowly, you know, you can see that it's starting to thaw and things are dripping off off of it the goo you like as i said before you could almost smell it and there's that head that's kind of been slowly pulled apart as the the thing itself is trying to imitate whoever it's taken over it's mind-boggling it really does to say that there was no kind of computer manipulation in any of this movie whatsoever is just absolutely mind-boggling and and i just sit back and i watch this movie every time uh, completely a gasp it, it's we have to say something first though and let's start from the beginning didn't this movie also have a messy start it was it was kind of a gamble wasn't it to do this movie yeah i, don't think, I guess so yeah. i don't think john was the first director you know to try to direct this this film okay really i didn't know this who who was i don't know i always assumed that because he was such a, a huge howard, Haw- howard hawks fan that um, that he was involved from the get go, but maybe maybe he wasn't. I from what I understand, the one scene that pulled John Carpenter on board was the blood test scene. After that, he was just like, "All right, I'll do it." After he read it, he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I could do something with that. That's, yeah, I'll do that." We certainly know that again. Kurt Russell wasn't <laughs> the studio's first pick to be McCready. He never yeah, is usually. <laughs> they wanted somebody older, didn't they? They um, they had two. They had two actors in mind jeff bridges and nick nolte and then um you know childs was originally supposed to be played by either isaac hayes or carl weathers oh really oh no i didn't know that imagine apollo (laughs) (laughs) come on now (laughs) (laughs) just punching the thing you know going back and forth (laughs) action jackson himself (laughs) <laughs> or but, like that, but 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 John Carpenter was always kind of you know he was always good with with African American leads mm-hmm. and you know when you look at Assault on Precinct Thirteen you know he cast um, Austin Stoker as the lead in that film in 1976 which you know didn't happen too much because unfortunately African Americans were usually either in black exploitation films or were used um, to be the victims and were killed off relatively early in movies. If you look at what George Romero did with Night of the Living Dead, and then as well in Dawn of the Dead, you know, casting African-American leads, John Carpenter was was kind of very similar as well uh, in his early days. And so, you know, hats off to him for that because he was doing something that a lot of directors wouldn't do around that time. And Charles, you know, I can't think of anybody better to play that role than Keith David. He's superb in that role. And it would uh, become a uh, John Carpenter alum with They Live. And yeah. The best knuckle brawl fight scenes <laughs> yeah. in movie history. Yeah, the street <laughs> fight is just something else, isn't it? It really is fantastic. The beginning of this movie, when we see McCready first, and uh, you know he's playing chess on that old-fashioned computer. You know, yeah. You could, you could tell that either everyone's bored, they're miserable there, it's super. It's really super cold because it's supposed to take place, what in Antarctica? Yeah, yeah, in the South Pole. Yeah, and um, you know the the only excitement that McCready has is, as he says, playing chess with this cheating bitch. <laughs> <laughs> 
It just pours as drink. It, it seems like everyone's stocked up on food and booze. <laughs> and do you know who that cheating bitch is? It is the wife of John Carpenter. It was. It was Adrian Barbeau. Or Boobo, as uh, the guy in the commentary that I listened to called her. Or Barboob, or whatever, anyway. But yeah, Adrian Barbeau. And we, we get this those the, the helicopter... Uh, you know, the only excitement they really have is the helicopter uh, being flown by the Norwegians on, from their base a few miles away, you know, chasing this poor dog. Yeah. We have no idea why. We don't know and why the dog's been chased, no. No, and then certainly um, the uh, character of Clark, he seems to be the dog wrangler, and they, he automatically get, they automatically jump to him, you know, and uh, no one speaks Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, and... Uh, just imagine if they could figure out what he was trying to say. I don't know if the commentary, if anyone could translate what he was trying to say. I think, I think you know, that it would have been a, a different story if, if they, they understood what the Norwegians were saying. You know, that the, there's a fucking alien nestled inside that dog somewhere. <laughs> Get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> but what was interesting about the Norwegians, if you look at the glasses that they're wearing... The, the, the goggles that these two guys are wearing are, are, are these kind of black goggles with these kind of um, slits across the middle. And they're um, the same goggles, albeit in white, make an appearance in Big Trouble in Little China too. Um, by the Is it the Lords of... Lords of Death. Lords of Death who kidnap uh, Miao Yin at the airport. Yeah, they're wearing the same glasses. Uh, whether that was a conscious effort or not, or whether it was just... You know, the fashion at the time, I don't know at all. But yeah, there, there's a, a, a tiny little connection there between the thing and Big Trouble in Little China, other than just Kurt Russell. <laughs> Easter egg, folks. Easter egg. Yeah, Easter egg. Easter egg. And but if uh, you look at the, what what's really interesting as well to me, and we, Frank and I have got like a cheat sheet on our screens now of all the cast members, because it's such a, let's say it's not the uh, most attractive bunch of people in the world. When you look at all the cast members. And this is what surprises me about it, because nowadays, a movie like this with such a kind of middle-aged or latter-aged, in some cases, a bunch of characters wouldn't probably be cast. It would They would go for younger, kind of good-looking guys, but other than Kurt Russell, hardly any of them kind of fall into that category. They're just kind of like, you know, guys that are in their 40s, 50s and 60s who aren't particularly attractive, and uh, but they're all good character actors, and it's something that you, you an ensemble like this is something that you don't see nowadays. Everybody's got to be, you know, uh, square jawed and and with big enamel teeth and and you know hot off a kind of Zac Efron production line, which to some extent is what they did in the kind of remake or pre make or prequel or whatever you want to call it. Um, everybody was a good looking person in that in that movie. Whereas well, with this, Darren, they have a woman there. And yeah, and there was a woman there. And yet, the, the only female in this movie, as we know, is the fucking chess machine that, that Kurt Russell <laughs> destroys in the opening scenes. Or the or, or the dogs, who knows? <laughs> well, maybe the dogs, yeah, maybe the dogs. But, um, but, but what no. What men will do with no, there's no women around on one piece. <laughs> But what also strikes me as as really um, as really interesting is that that Blair, played by Wilfred Brimley, was in his late forties. I think he was around about forty seven when he did the thing. The guy looks close to seventy. He was born that <laughs> old, these, wasn't he? He was just he was, yeah. Maybe there's like a Benjamin Button thing going on with with Wilfred Brimley. I don't know, but um, uh, yeah, he 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 aged young, didn't he? He never quite looked his age ever, I don't think. I mean, just imagine a studio saying, we have to age you more. <laughs> uh, you're pissing me off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for anybody who hasn't seen the, um, uh, who's, who's got the Blu-ray or hasn't got the Blu-ray, you should check it out because there's some new content on there, which is just fabulous. There's a new kind of feature-length documentary, which is really good. But there's also um, a panel from from a, a convention in 2017 that Arrow did where they had uh, Ryan Turek interviewing Dean Cundy, Wilford Brimley, um, Thomas G. Waits, who plays Windows, and also Keith David. And it's great fun. It really is. They really let you into some of the uh, some great anecdotes as to what, what, what happened on set. And Wilford Brimley, 
he can barely remember making the film, let alone give you an anecdote. He's just sat there, like, can't quite make his look out that he's at this convention and all these people are there appreciating him. He's just a bit kind of taken back by it all. But it's a nice watch. You should, you should, you should give it a go. Is this Cocoon 3? <laughs> <laughs> pretty soon, Wilford. Pretty soon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I bless him. He passed away, you know, I don't know, what, six months ago or something, didn't he? Yeah, just recently. Um, mm. The first time we, we, we just touched on this, but the first time we saw what the thing can actually do, this gene morphing, you know, assimilation of other organisms around it. That first monster was actually done by Stan Winston. The the dog scene. The dogs, yeah. That, yeah. Rob Bottee was in the hospital. He got an ulcer. A oh, really? Ulcer. I didn't know this. Yeah, oh, wow. he got. He went to the hospital. At 22? Yeah, he because he would start working at night when the set was closed on makeup. And he was just exhausted. And the doctor would come in and just say, look, you got an ulcer. <laughs> and, you know, you're going to have to lay low for a little bit. And Stan Winston's not credited because he said... Wow. This kid is very talented. You know, I, I just can't, I, I came in to help out, but give him all the credit because it's amazing what this kid can do. Yeah. And and, and when we first see this this uh, dog, isn't he, um, or this monster, he's trying to kill all the other dogs, right? Trying to... He is, yeah. You know, a couple of them get away. You never see them again. This is where they're first, they, they really say, we get, we, we have a problem here and, and not so many words. And then uh, it, it really goes downhill from there. Yeah, and it's also the first, you know, I mean, the dog splitting its head open is just a, it's just disgusting. I don't, I, even now looking at that, it's just a horrific effect. It's almost like a dog's head turns into like a banana or something and the, and peels back. It, it's, it's, it's a fantastic effect. And, you know, it's, it's also a scene where as a leader within the group is established as well because everybody's kind of freaked out by this, you know, what's going on with the dog's. And the only kind of level-headed ones are really sort of is is Charles to some extent, and and Macready. Macready kind of takes the lead in this scene, and he mm -hmm. he comes in with the flamethrower and deals with the situation. But you know we don't realise that the thing at this point has already jumped ship to um, to somebody else within the group, selected its next victim. He has, yeah. and uh, we, the only way we know that is because of the shadow. The shadow on the wall, which yeah. uh, we, which um, it turns out to be Norris, played by Charles Hallahan. And um, I, I love the one part where, because this all this movie is, is who is it? It's a guessing game, like Clue. I think for me, when they're testing out the blood, because they figure out, you know, this is genetic, it's DNA, um, it's certainly uh, it is impervious to bullets, as we found out when Gary kind of, kind of shoots it and it just does nothing that the right the flamethrower thing is the only thing you got to do is burn it and the norwegians actually figured that out as well you know they go with this charred remain palmer when he starts turning into the thing where they're tying everybody up that that scared the hell out of me when they found out it was him and he's just shaking you know <laughs> uh but before that it was, it was charles's spider head <laughs> you know whether yeah yeah i mean that isn't that iconic that that head you go into these sequences kind of not knowing how the scene's going to play out because nobody's imagination could could ever run that wild apart from Rob Bottin's. Okay, so this guy's going to start um, going into cardiac arrest. We're going to... I mean, the last time... We know something's going to happen because the last time we saw that happening to somebody was probably John Hurt in Alien mm -hmm. and something burst out of his chest. This time, we're bursting into this guy's chest. <laughs> so... The, uh, uh, Dr. Copper, uh, he picks up the defibrillator and plunges it down on Norris's chest once. He then goes down again a second time. And then I think it's the third time that he goes down. Th basically, the thing retaliates because it's th it thinks it's being attacked by the electric shocks. And so the chest opens up, teeth come out at the sides. Dr. Copper's arms go into the body of, no of Norris and the teeth clamp shut. The body clamps shut on Norris on Copper's arms and just rip them off at the elbows. And the, the, there's blood spurting. People are shouting. The thing's starting to mutate again. It's a it's a horrific scene and all done again in front of you. The fact that there's no 
computer interference in this movie whatsoever is just astonishing and and you're seeing everything play out as it happens it's it's certainly probably the most shocking scene of this movie yeah so this purpose of this thing so is it like everything it touches it can it, it mutates it to something right it's kind of like a virus and i think so yeah and no, i think it's just trying it's to not survive. explained right it's not it's not explained what it's it can a, do I, th- I i think that it just ha- it has it's okay i guess it's like a virus in the fact that it has to continue to live uh, and as the tagline great tagline for the movie man is the warmest place to hide it takes on the human form in order to kind of stay alive but blair finds out what would happen if this thing after being infecting you know his friends what would happen if this thing ever got out into warmer climate and into the real world doesn't he the thing you think would take over the whole con- the whole planet yeah and, and, and a fairly quick period of time as well so what does wilford brimley do <laughs> he, he he wrecks the place in, in a mad yeah, diabetic just, fit <laughs> yeah yeah he he's just smashing the place up taking pot shots at people and and um yeah this is where we we did that the scene with the axe always surprises me as well because it looks like a real axe he swings it at um i think it's kurt russell who's holding a uh like a a trestle table or something Mm -hmm. and the axe goes through the trestle table literally just a few inches away from kurt russell's face now whether that's an effect or not i don't know but it looks pretty real to me and it looks like a pretty close call doesn't it we'll keep it good (laughs) yeah It's like you feel like he's the only one that really knows. He he, he tries to tell everybody. Do you really think he wants that, that Blair wants to kill everybody too? Did you I get think, that? Yeah, um, I just think he wants to be listened. He, as you said, you know, he kind of freaks out, and that, that kind of makes his argument less credible. Um, but if you think about it, he's kind of right all the way through the film <laughs> until it until it gets him. Yeah. At which point, I'm not quite sure when. It's kind of. It's a little bit like the Halloween 3, and at what point does Stacey Nelkin become the robot? You know, is she a robot all along, or is there a scene where as the, she's made into a robot? It's the same with the thing. You're kind of guessing as to who's who, and there are a lot of kind of theories out there as to at what point people become the thing. A lot of those have been debunked as well, and when we get to the end scene, I didn't realise that that particular rumour about the finale had been debunked recently as well but um yeah blair um uh, they they kind of isolate him don't they to kind of will to protect him and to protect the rest of the camp um because he's just kind of losing it with the knowledge that he's got about this and there's there's a great moment where kurt russell goes up to speak to him and you've got this fantastic shot which is from the outside of the cabin through to to, to blair sat at his desk talking to kurt russell through a noose <laughs> this noose in the foreground and nobody mentions it <laughs> no it's nobody mentions the noose <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's super but, but I'm it's fine in- now <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you know that that um so blair we know what what his fate is tk carter just kind of disappears at the end he just sort of walks off down the uh uh, the corridor. This is the character Knowles. Palmer, we know, dies during the blood testing sequence, and the blood Mel- testing sequence melting face, right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic, and it and it and such a great effect as well. Because if you look closely, you can see where when the effect begins. Um, so they're, they're testing the blood. They're using a hot copper wire to to uh, testing each 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 other's blood in this in a, in a petri dish. And again, like the defibrillator scene, they're convinced that if the hot copper wire is stuck into the blood, the blood will react and fight back. And the hand that Kurt Russell is holding up to the camera is obviously a fake hand. If you look, you can you can see exactly at which point they start to use a fake hand. It's 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 completely you know you buy into it completely it's only when it's pointed out to you that you realize that that's what they're doing and so you see a few shots of this fake hand so you in your head the effect is already working it's beginning and the moment that it reacts and and this petri dish explodes and the creature comes out it's almost like this has happened in front of you on screen 
but in, in effect, you've been watching it for a good 10 or 15 seconds without knowing that what you're looking at is an effect. It's really cleverly done. And yeah, so the, the thing erupts. It comes out of the Petri dish and, and starts to attack everyone. I think a few of the characters, um, Gary and uh, Childs, are strapped to the chairs, aren't they? They can't move. The thing's attacking everybody. Palmer, um, as you said, his head melts. He starts hemorrhaging blood out of his eyeballs. And eventually it splits open and picks up windows uh, and starts dancing around the room with uh, Windows' head in its mouth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's chaos. It's carnage is this sequence. They must have had so much fun filming it, throwing blood and goo around and... You know, but yeah, Get me we the lose. Fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we lose two or three people in this sequence. Uh, but one was uh, yeah, because uh, McCready shoots Clark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, again, that's a that's a you know one of the things that I picked up on the commentary was that you know the the, the guys on the commentary are saying that you know Blair's right with his his theories throughout the film, and he does say early on in the movie, watch Clark. Now, was he saying watch Clark because Clark is the thing? Or was he saying watch Clark because of what he's capable of? He's stalking McCready with a fucking scalpel in his hand and actually goes to, you know, to, to stick him with it at one point, which is when McCready turns around and blows the top of Clark's head off. <laughs> Clark, from the beginning, was kind of that... It seems like he was been he's been at that base far too long, and is is going nuts. It's it's certainly his way of lashing out, because we don't know how long these people have been here, or maybe individually or as a group. It's it's isolation, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's driving yeah. everybody crazy, and this is just another uh, another crazy moment to feed on their paranoia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, an excuse to kill people too. <laughs> how many transformations do we really see in this movie we have the dog we've got the dog we've got um bennings bennings briefly who 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 starts to transform but then uh, is um torched uh before he before that, that can fully happen yeah yeah he's his hand starts to change and you get that kind of really horrible howl that he gives off just before he's burnt alive who else have we got norris yeah he norris, yeah, yeah he's yeah dr copper was did he he was starting Do to change Do did dr copper no he um he was the one that lost his arms in the in the chest and one thing i should say about dr copper was and this is hats off to how good the blu-ray trans transfer is on this film when i was a kid and even looking at this kind of cheat sheet of character faces at the moment I never realized that that guy had a nose ring in throughout the movie. <laughs> He's got a nose ring in his right nostril throughout the whole movie. And on the VHS and DVDs, I, I couldn't pick that up at all. I never knew until I watched the Blu-ray version of this movie. It's And it's clear as day. It's just something I've never picked up on before. Uh, Windows starts changing. Right? Doesn't he? Uh, he becomes win a Windows. Windows starts to change, but again, he gets flamethrowed doesn't he, before he can uh, simulate fully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and what about um, what about Joel Pohl's character, uh, uh, Fuchs? He, he he doesn't he burn himself alive or something? We because originally there's a scene where as he he the thing kills him with a, a shovel. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of skewers him to the wall um, and the cast and this is something that came out of the um, the Q&A session that I watched yesterday was that the cast argued with John Carpenter that you know the thing wouldn't kill somebody with a weapon it would just use its own powers to be able to, to kill them he, he was fa there's, a, there's a sequence which was removed uh, from the film whereas uh, Joe Polis is, or Fuchs as his character's called, is, is impaled on the wall with a shovel. Um, uh, but they removed it, and I th think it's intimated that... Or do they not find some remains or something? I've, I'm trying to remember now. Anyway, it's not something we see on camera. I, I think towards the end, with Blair, was it right to isolate him? Was he digging a tunnel out, or was the thing 
digging a tunnel in to that shack. Um, he was he was he was using um the underground part, wasn't he, as a a lair to build a spaceship, a craft, which I, I guess was to 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 get out of the place, mm-hmm. um, because it had been I guess frozen for so many years. Um, and he he's just kind of building this sort of crappy craft which is out of any old piece of shit that you can find lying around and hammering it all together. It's quite impressive, actually, isn't it? Yeah. It's quite yeah. impressive. I, I, you know, that Wilford uh, Brimley put all this together. <laughs> at what point is he... What point did, they, did he turn? I think it... <sighs> that's a question, right? I think that's a big I, question. I, I think it is a big question, and I think it's probably around the time of... Um, when when Blair goes nuts, um, it's not long after that, I don't think, because I as- assume that the the reason why the noose is there and hasn't been used is because the thing has taken over him before he could do that, and so there's now no interest in in killing himself because the thing has to survive. Does that yeah. sound right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So so that's what that's what I assume. Did you like how Blair killed Gary with with his finger with his fingers in his ah, face? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was another thing that was that was another thing that that I I learned over the last couple of days as well. That the obsession with mouths in this film, um, how mouths play a big part in it, right from right from the beginning with the split head and the split mouth, all the way through to um, uh, mouth opening up in Norris's belly as the docks going down with the defibrillators. The mouth, Palmer's head opening up as a big mouth, and mm-hmm. <laughs> and Picking then the dogs, <laughs> yeah, the dogs, <laughs> the dogs' head splitting open as a, you know as this kind of mouth that goes into four bits, and then eventually the the you know um, Blair or Blair monster as he starts to become then. Um, sticking his hand in uh, in Gary's mouth, in Donald Moffat's mouth, and 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 splitting the whole face very very slowly. It's 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 a horrible effect. Is that? It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and then we get to the monster at the end, right? He's just. He's, it's almost like it's a bigger version of everything it ever touched. Yeah, yeah. And it, and what's really sad is that that. Um, they did a, a kind of stop motion animation Blair monster, and a guy spent months putting this final scene together. Which, let's face it, is that the the final scene is 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 really short lived. Is that confrontation? Mm-hmm. It's not a big finale or anything like. That. It's really understated, and and when it works, it works really well. Um, but unfortunately, the original ending that they that they created just looked too much like kind of. Ardman animation or something, and it, I don't know if you've seen it, but it is pretty. Uh, the, at the side of the effects in the rest of the movie, it's kind of like a Ray Harryhausen effect, which was mm-hmm. done, but maybe not quite as good, and it just really sticks out like a sore thumb. And so they they ditched that after this guy had spent months and months animating it. it, it it's such a shame. Uh, and then you know they re reshot it with some of uh, Rob Bottin's uh, work. And and as you said, it is. It's kind of. Um, an assimilation of all the different um, monsters that have been earlier in the film. You've got the dog in there. You've got, I think, you've got um, somebody's face as well. Is it? I can't remember whether it's Palmer's or Window's face that's that's embedded in there. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, Blair's face as well. I think is in there as well, isn't it? Because he's kind of split at the side, and one half of his face has turned into this huge set of jaws. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really a really cool final uh, version of the thing that we see before Kurt Russell gets <laughs> fucked off and throws dynamite at it. And it's kind of like, you kind of get some foreshadowing of that earlier on because it, his kind of whole thing is, if I, if I can't beat you, I'm going to destroy you, which is like with the, the chest machine, you know, he, he threw his, his whiskey into the chest machine and, and, and blew it up because it got, he got fucked off that it was beating him. And with this here, he's just kind of like fucked off with this whole thing now and he just throws dynamite at it to get rid of it. He made a statement. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, when I saw that, 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 that final thing monster, I remember thinking, oh, it was... It, one of the other movies I saw that kind of ripped off of that was the monster from Leviathan. 
how it had mm. all the faces of every person that it infected. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I thought it was. I thought that that was pretty cool. That you know, you're still living within this this thing, um, and and there's no way to go around it. Um, but I heard there was wasn't there multiple endings film besides you know Childs and and, and McGreedy just sitting there and just either waiting for someone to either turn or waiting them for both of them to die. Uh, but this was the ending that John Carpenter picked, but everybody hated it. I, I don't know. Yeah, there were. There were a few different endings, I think. Um, it's, it's almost like the, the ending to Halloween and they shot Donald Pleasance's final lines in, in different ways. I like the ending of the thing. I like the ambiguity. Mm-hmm. You know, for a while, somebody brought up the fact that it's Charles, it's Charles, because he's got no breath uh, in that final sequence. Which is true. When he sat down talking to MacReady, he has no breath. But the sequence before that, where you see him walk into that area where they sit down, he's clearly breathing, and you can see breath coming out of his mouth. And watching the Q&A the other day, Keith David, who played Charles, points out that the reason why he's got no breath is because he's closer to the fire than Kurt Russell is. So where the area he sat is a lot warmer, but it, but I believe in the comic book continuation that happened a few years later. He was, it, it was Charles that the, that was the thing. Let's let's go because we can't not talk about it. What did you really think about the prequel? Um, I think that there was a lot of it was delayed for some time after it was after it was shot and everybody assumed it was because it was pretty bad and. And so my expectations were really low for it. I didn't mind it. I thought it was okay, and that's it. And I did like some of the nods in there, and I haven't seen it for six or seven years, so, you know, don't ask me to what... I do, I do remember there were nods in there. I What I was disappointed with and since learned about it was that they did do it originally with pra- practical effects, but they couldn't help but fucking meddle. <laughs> and get some you get some computer animation in there you know some CGI on top of it all which is what really kind of it sticks out more than it does using practical effects it's it's a shame I, mean, I remember that guy's head contorting or breaking up and you can just tell it's just digitally rendered it's um it's such a shame yeah i i, I can barely get through it every time i see on my uh, tv guide you know the thing, and I'm like, oh great, 1982. No, it's the, you know, I think it's 2012. It yeah, came out. Yeah. It's like, oh no, it's the, it's that piece of shit one. Because it, it, I don't think it does it justice. Uh, but no one ever questions that though, do they? No one ever no. thought of, no one ever. If you say you're watching the thing, I think people automatically assume that it's the the 1982 version. Um, and why they called it the same. Tile, I've, I've no idea, but I think that Bloomhouse are kind of going back to redo it again, aren't they? Which kind of makes me a little bit really. If it's not broke, uh, don't fix it. Again, yeah, yeah, and they're going to make it more in line with the original, the original book, the Who Goes There. But you can just see that if it's Bloomhouse, everybody's going to be square jawed and good looking, and it'll be a, you know, it won't, it won't be an all male cast. I'm not saying it should be, but that, but. You know, it will be a mixture, and it'll be it'll be very Bloomhouse. I think <laughs> it won't be anything like what we're used to seeing here. It'll be very woke. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. it. Uh, I think what they should have done after this, because it did. We, we, you and I both agree this is a cult classic. This is probably one of the, probably what top three John Carpenter movies of all time. Yeah, and I, but not only that, I think it's, it's one of the greatest horror movies of all time. Uh, practical effect wise, too. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's, it's, they should have done what the 2002 video game did, which is also called The Thing. When you bought this video game, they gave you a copy of the movie. So mm. it was a win win. Yeah. Um, yeah. Carpenter endorsed it, uh, he also voiced. A couple uh, characters in it. And you know, John Carpenter loves video games. He loves mm. them. It dealt with a guy. Uh, I believe his name is Blake, 
going back to the same American base to find out what happened. You basically uh, go around and you, you fight the thing. And you find survivors and survivors tag along with you. But then all of a sudden one may turn on you because you can actually uh, test everybody's blood in the game. And, and if it touched you, you can take some sort of antidote to keep it back. It, was, it actually did very well. It was actually a big seller. Um, and of course, we find out in that video game what happens to Giles and McCready. Yeah, M yeah. Uh, McCready is actually a helicopter pilot that helps the person uh, helps uh, Blake uh, fight the thing at the end and picks him up, and you find out that Child's actually died from exposure. So it's, it's a good game. I remember play I never actually finished the game. I started to play it and really enjoyed it. I thought it was incredibly atmospheric. I just remember wandering around different cabins and the and the the the, the mix on the audio was terrific. It really immersed you. I wish I'd have persevered with it um but but no I, I thought they did a really good job and i remember at the time it was really well received wasn't it as one of the yeah. sort of better yeah. movie movie tie-ins uh, and it had great a great cover as well i remember you know the the artwork for it was really good it, it certainly was one of those the same settings and atmosphere as like a Re resident evil or silent hill mm. uh, it wasn't dull it was, it was it, no. like you said the atmosphere it was it was very scary but it, could they even do a sequel I mean, could they do a sequel years later after this one? Uh, because, you know, the the critics, everybody hated it. They did. It's, it's incredible, the, the reception it got at the time. But but Darren, it was it was so well... I shouldn't say it. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't so well received by the critics that the famous critic himself, Roger Ebert, said the thing is a great barf bag of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the, it's 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 a geek show. It's a gross-out movie, which teenagers can dare one another to watch the screen. I mean, it, it. He said it was not Alien. Again, there it is again. Another comparison to Alien. Yeah. I, yeah the interest. Yeah. The, the the reviews largely at the time were just were, were terrible. Um, but also, you know, for those of you who don't know, it was an absolute box office bomb. Uh, the movie cost $15 million. Its opening re weekend was $3 million, and it grossed worldwide $19.6 million, which is pretty poor for a film like that, which everybody expected was going to be the, the highlights of the summer. But let's just, let's just have a look at that summer when the movie came out, because everything was set up for this movie to be a huge success. So in the May of, of 1982, you had Conan the Barbarian, The Road Warrior, Annie, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, and Rocky Three. Something for everybody there, you know? It was a busy, busy summer month, and The Thing was released in June. The Thing was released on June the 23rd. But before The Thing came out on June 23rd, it had to put up with all the releases from May, like I just mentioned, but also Poltergeist, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, E.T., Grease 2. Now, okay, Grease 2 was uh, was a bomb, but at the time, no one would have known that. Um, Firefox with Clint Eastwood. And on the same day that The Thing was released, it was released with Blade Runner. Oh. Blade Runner and Megaforce. Now, it really didn't stand a chance. Universal were quite savvy because they, they actually they put a, a trailer for the thing on every single print of E.T. when it was released. And we all know how big E.T. was. Mm -hmm. But obviously, there was confusion as to what the thing was because E.T. was this cuddly little alien family movie. The thing couldn't be any far. <laughs> <laughs> they're away from it. <laughs> Quick, throw some Reese's pieces at the fucking yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> this this has been said countless times before, but with a cast like this, basically fourteen males, fourteen middle aged males, set in the Antar in Antarctica, it should have been released in the fall. Absolutely, should have been released in the autumn. You know, a nice an October movie, 
an October November movie and I'm I'm sure it would have done a lot better around that kind of late October Halloween date a John Carpenter movie around Halloween um or a John Even Carpenter December, horror snow, around Halloween snowfall island yeah island. yeah exactly but no they released it in the middle of June on the same day as Blade Runner 2 weeks after ET it it was just never going to work no. Um, and even even following it, the weeks following it, they had the Secret of Nim, the Don Bluth animation, which was which was huge. They had Tron. They had the World According to Garp. You had an Officer and a Gentleman. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Friday the Thirteenth, three D. The summer of eighty two was absolutely rammed, and it just didn't stand a chance whatsoever. It was overlooked. The poster did nothing, but it was it's iconic. When you when you had like E. T. you know, like you said, this this nice, cute little alien, you know, and, and Blade Runner with its all its effects. Uh it, it's it's a shame because it's it was overlooked because other movies that appeal to everybody's other people's sensibilities came out. And that word of mouth came out. Did you see E.T.? No. Oh, you gotta see it. It's fantastic. Did you see Tron? No, the visuals are are are, are great. Did you see the thing? The what? What thing? <laughs> oh, you mean E.T.? Yeah, I saw the thing. That thing, right? It, it's... It, it. Plus with the critics saying, you know, it was a barf bag. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I just took a look at the Rotten Tomatoes score and um, the, the Rotten Tomatoes score is 85% fresh and the audience scores something around about 92, which is about right. It should be like that. Yeah. But I think that that has been counter balanced by reviews when I look at it of people revisiting it over the years I think if if you took all the original reviews um, at the time then this would be a um, um, a certified a splat or whatever <laughs> certified fresh no no but if if it's bad there's a, a, a oh rotten that was it it's <laughs> rotten <laughs> so yeah so uh, it's it's good that over time people have revisited it over the years and and re-reviewed it and you know it's it's oh it's a classic isn't it it's yeah just, it's a fantastic film it holds a special place in both yeah you, know, you know my heart and as well as your heart and it's in our video library because that's where we still call it folks our video library <laughs> uh, but maybe this maybe the thing would have been a lot better if they put in the uh, orgy scene at the end of society. Uh, <laughs> oh, these guys? Yeah. <laughs> At least Devin DeVasquez was there, you know. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, that's what the thing, when I first saw it, you know, it's, you know, when I first, really quick, uh, first saw Society, I was like, these things look like the thing. They're all goopy and slimy and, and orgied with each other. <laughs> but, oh, dude. You know, it's, uh, but also everyone keeps on. Revisit, revisiting, like you said, the thing. Everyone talks about it on the major platforms of media, uh, getting back to what made practical effects great and what made John Carpenter a household name in that particular genre of pushing the envelope. And certainly Rob Bottin, you know, it was just, it's amazing how a guy that young, you know, uh, I, I, I could barely, you know, drive at his age and he's doing Academy Award winning uh, makeup effects. Yeah. It's, it's incredible, isn't it? Absolutely yeah. incredible. So what are we doing next? <laughs> so next, next. So, 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 yeah, I mean, that was the thing, folks. That was yeah. the thing. Uh, and next we are, we've got something coming up with Dave McRae soon, which I need to kind of um, firm up that date. Um, but I think next week we're going to talk about slashers, but not slashers like Michael, Freddy, Jason, Leatherface, all those guys. Slashes outside of those kind of main iconic ones. Um, and probably so, yeah. some slashers people don't really think about as slashers. Yeah, it's, it's going to really, be interesting. Yeah, I think I think slashers is a big genre. I think people always mm. love a good slasher movie. And also, we'll probably drop some kind of bonus episode this week. I think the other day we just did one on um, bad horror sequels. Maybe we'll look at good horror sequels or something this week. Yeah, yeah maybe. Or- or orgies. Well, maybe we'll do orgies. Yeah, yeah. Good, uh, bad orgies. Let's bad, do bad, bad and good orgies. <laughs> As always, stick to the roads. And the best of luck. <laughs>